right. So we are continuing from our tie dye techniques. So we have for uh, today this lesson tie dye processes. The tie dye processes. If you want to dye, what processes do you use? What ways, in what ways can you dye? For example, if it were sewing, would have asked you, in what ways can you sew your garment? And maybe our answer would be, oh, we can sew using the flat method or the round method. That is a process. It is not a technique. It is a process. So we just learned dyeing technique. How to manipulate the fabric here now how do we die because if you want to die you choose a, a one process of dying okay you choose a process of dying so what are some of the processes of dying so the dye process so tie dye we have learned what uh, dyeing is already. However, it is a resist dyeing technique that often uses bright, saturated colors and bold patterns. That is tie dye. Some say tie and dye, tie and dye, but in normal formal term, we say tie dye. You tie dye. Sorry? It is. So, tie-dye uses bright colors, okay? It's a technique that can, that's why I say it's a resist dyeing because in any case, there is an area that would have to resist the dye for you to get the patterns. Those are the positive areas. So, you use bright colors. Colors can be bright. They can be saturated as in dark or whatever, mixed, and then bold patterns so to tie dye you first fold or crumple like the example i stated you can just crumple the fabric uh, and tie it with a string or rubber bands then dip the fabric in buckets of dye or apply the dye with squirt bottles you know what squirt bottles are the bottles that have thin sprouts you can mix your dye pour it in the squirt bottle then instead of immersing your fabric in the dye solution you arrange the fabric on a rack because when you put it on the table and you press the bottle and the dye falls on the fabric uh, it will create another solution on the table and the fabric will still soak it meanwhile you want it to take a certain pattern so if you are going to use a squirt bottle then it's better to get something like a rack that is up from a flat surface. So you can lay your foot, your fabric, or even if it's a t-shirt you are dying, you can lay it on it. After you have done your folding or your dyeing technique you want to use. So you place it on the, on the rack and then press your squirt bottle so that the dye can come out. And then you spread it on the fabric and it will absorb the fabric. So that is one way. Of dyeing. Dyeing doesn't always mean that you have your dye mixed and you have poured it into a bucket or a bowl and you immerse the whole fabric into it. That is why we are learning dyeing processes because there are so many processes. And the effect you are looking for will determine the process, dyeing process you will use. Okay. So the folds and ties act as a resist preventing the dye from saturating the fabric evenly. Any place that the dye can't reach will stay quiet. That is if you use a quiet fabric. Okay, so in any case, that area will stay with the background color. Okay, not necessarily white. It is only white when your fabric is, was white before you dyed. Then creates to create a design or creating a design. So if you are asked to write a short note on tie dye, this is what you can write to explain it. Now, types of tie dye, the, the types. 
There are a few different categories of Thai dye techniques. Traditional Thai dye. What is the traditional Thai dye? The traditional Thai dye is characterized by bright colors and bold patterns. The Thai dyes that we used to do at first, when they, they do the Thai dye, you realize that all the motives in it are big, 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 most at first, when we started this whole business. So, this is where you have very huge patterns and the colors are bright, mostly. So, this one is for the traditional uh, Thai dye, okay? So, this type of tie dye starts with a plain white shirt or fabric, which is then tied and dyed with one or more colors of liquid dye. Very simple. But just that the patterns are big and the colors are brighter. Now we have more complicated ways of dyeing. Then we have the ice dye. Ice dye. How do we do the ice dye? Do you, know, do you have an idea? Have you seen some before? Or a video of some before? How is it done? Huh? Yes, you use ice cubes. Uh -huh. You can use ice cubes. Even if you don't have ice cubes, you can tie your uh, water and rubber, once there's block and you will crack, crack it once you are getting a lot of cubes, depending on what you want. Now, assuming we are dyeing something like a t-shirt, even if it is a fabric, and you have done your technique, uh, uh, tying techniques, whatever you have used, again, you will use your rack, for example, and then all you a container, a small container, then you put your fabric or probably the shirt in that container. Then you pour your ice over it first. Then you sprinkle your dye on the ice. So the dye is going to be on the ice. So the ice, you have to wait for the ice to, be, to melt completely or to be melted. So the, 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 the ice melting will give your work the pattern that you are looking for. Okay, that is ice dye. So if you read, ice dye is similar to traditional tie dye, but the process is a little different. It starts with the same, with a white or lighted colored garment or fabric, tied or secured with rubber bands. Then the garment is covered in ice cubes. Okay, a lot, a lot and sprinkled with colors of powdered dye, okay? So, as the ice melts, it will dissolve the dye powders and saturate the fabric. This type of tie dye can create some eye-catching organic designs. That design is very beautiful, right? That is for ice dye. So, you see, if you don't choose to do traditional dye, you can choose to do ice dye, or you can tie dye with bleach. The bleach one, you don't use dye at all. You use bleach. The one we are used to, right? the bleach we are used to over here is parazon, right? So you can have your parazon, then you can have your colored fabric. Your colored fabric or shirt, t shirt. So, this is where, it is like the way we bleach fabric. So you have your fabric. You have to use your dyeing technique, whether you are tying it, whether you are folding it, whether you want to scramble or scrunch the fabric, whatever technique you use. You go through all that. Then, the next moment, you see you need to dip your fabric also into water so that the fabric can be able to absorb the bleach also easily. So you dip your whatever into water, squeeze the excess water out, then lay your bleach, your fabric or the t-shirt, if it's you are using the t-shirt, on a rack. And then you introduce the bleach to the areas that you want 
to bleach. So once you spread your bleach on the areas, you leave it oxidation. You have to leave it to open air. It oxidizes. It's fast. You don't bleach and go and put it in the corner. It has to be open. Why do we soak our clothes in a in bucket and we don't cover the buckets in our houses? We don't cover, we cover them. So you only leave it to open air like this. It will bleach properly. So it will bleach. Whilst it is bleaching, you will watch it. Because if it starts bleaching, it bleaches from light. Uh, sorry, a darker tone. Then it will become brighter, brighter. So you choose how you want the bleach to the work. So if it gets to your desired bleach color, then you can remove it and go and raise it. That is the only time the bleaching stops. Do you get it? So you can do tie dye with bleach. We'll be doing that. We'll be doing it. Okay. So those are the um, different uh, bleaching methods that we use. However, note that the traditional tie dye method is the one people still do now. Aside the bright colors and bold patterns, this one, the fabric or whatever you are dyeing is immersed into the dye bath. So that is the traditional uh, tie dye. Okay, anything that you have to immerse into the tie uh, dye, immerse into the dye stuff is the traditional method. Do you get it? So in addition is the ice dye and then the bleach. Any questions? All right. So let's look at some tie dye supplies. Some of the things you need to be able or to aid you in dying easily without sweat. Which are some of the materials that we need. Okay? So, some of the tools are fiber reactive dyes in assorted colors. You buy different types of dyes. Uh, the type of dye you buy, depending on the type of fabric, you are dying. If you remember in our second or first lesson, I think second lesson or third, we learned about the type of dyes that are proper for particular fibers. So you buy your dye according to the kind of fabric you are going to dye. So you consider that before you purchase your dye. Then you have your fabric items. Your fabric items. So we have fabric items, like your fabric, your shirts, socks or sweat shirts, okay? Then you have soda ash. This one, you may need it or not need it, depending on the type of dye you use. The soda ash is just used to enhance absorption of the dye. So you just mix it with water, soak your fabric in it for a, a while before you soak it into a um, Dye bath. However, we have the fabric. The fabric we buy is has already gone through mesmerization. Has gone through that process already. That is why usually we don't go using the soda ash at that point. So we just soak our fabric into water to make it wet and absorbent before we um, soak it into the dye bath. So we are not going to use soda ash at this point because the dyes we are buying, the chemicals we are using already contains these things. So you buy soda ash as on its own. Okay. Now this is Sintrapol or another laundry detergent. Not necessarily this Sintrapol. Once we have a detergent soap, any soap that we use to wash, that why do we wash dyed fabric? Once you dye your fabric and you are done, you need to go and wash it, but you need to wash with soap. Why? Uh -huh. Yes, that's true, and also, so first of all, yeah, when when uh, you check color fastness, that is correct, but in checking color fastness too, the excess colors will also come out. The colors that have not been able to disperse 
into the fibers of the family. If you remember in one of our lessons, we mentioned that it died, two things happen. I think lesson three or something like that. Two things happen, absorption and diffusion. The fibers absorb the dye, and then diffusion means is the uh, dyes are dispersed into the fibers of the yarn. So the ones that went through absorption but didn't go through diffusion will leave the fabric, and then we will also solve that problem of color fastness because if the fabric goes through that post dyeing treatment, and somebody buys the fabric and uses it to stitch, stitch a garment. The fabric is not going to run out in case the color is not going to run out in case it goes through washing you see and also it brings out the patterns you have made clearly okay you have made certain patterns it will make it very clear all right design will be clear that is one of the uh, reasons why we do washing with detergent not just water then we have rubber and Two, we used chemicals. So those chemical exercises has to leave the fabric. Caustic soda, you know what happens to, with your skin. If it falls on your skin, it will chop it to, and then you will have a sore right there. So we have rubber bands or strong string or uh, raffia or you can even have polythene and you cut them in strips, whatever you want to use to resist the dye. We have buckets or bowls, containers to dip items in the dye. We have our squeeze bottles or squirt bottles, it's the same thing, to apply dye if you are going to use that process. Then we have plastic tablecloths or large trash bags to protect your work surface. So where, when do we need the trash bags, especially as you this our table, we have, we can even buy Macintosh, you know Macintosh, yes, or, as, or any rubber, we have so many types of rubbers. So we, or plastic, this, we arrange them or lay them on our table. When we die, maybe we are dying about five fabrics. When we die, we can just put it on the, the, the rubber so that the table, or the surface of the table will be protected. And two, if we were doing we were dying using squirt bottles. Remember that we would have been using rack or a rack. So we place the thing over a rack and then we press our squirt bottles. What is going to happen? The excess dye will be dripping from the bottom of the... So in that case, you drip on the rubber and not the table. Okay. So we have a wire rack to elevate the garment off the work surface. Which is optional because if you don't, you are not doing wire uh, uh, certain tech, uh, methods of dyeing or processes of dyeing, you may not need the wire. So, depending on the process of dyeing you are using, gloss is a mask and a dust mask, like we call nose masks, face mask. So, gloss to prevent our hands from the chemicals we are using. Then we have zip top bags or plastic wrap. These zip top bags, sometimes when people are dyeing shirts or fabrics that uh, are not of a very large quantity, when they are done, they put it in a zip lock bag and close it uh, for the process to, the dyeing process to take place properly inside um, the, the bags before they remove it or expose it to air. Okay, we have uh, that method too. So these are some of the tie-dye uh, supplies we have, or we, have, we need for our class. However, we'll be buying caustic soda, hydro, they are the chemical, you do sulfite or sulfate, they are the chemicals we are going to use in addition to the powdered dye. With what we are doing, that is what we are going to use. Okay, you need those things. There's some of the extra things you may need, maybe storage containers to store the remaining of your dyes and then the uh, chemicals. You store them separately. All right. So in brief, here is how to dye. You are asked, how do you dye? 
if I ask you to write for me a dying method, you are supposed to, these are just points. So you have to express yourself. So the first is that you prepare your supplies and set up your work area. It is not when you have mixed your dye, they are like, hey, where are my gloves? Oh, they are in the cupboard. No, 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 no. Make sure everything is set with you on your table before you start work. Okay? You mix your dyes, pre-soak your garment or fabric if necessary. This pre-soaking is what I was talking about, and that is why some people pre-soak it in soda ash. But we don't need soda ash, so we pre-soak in plain water. Then you fold and tie your garment. So you see this fold and tie your garment. Some people, when you soak, and your fabric is bigger. By the time you fold it, some parts will dry a bit. So the best option is to do all your time. When you finish, then you soak it. Because the areas that are open are the areas that will take the water. And that's the area that will take the dye. So there is no need like soaking your fabric before you come and tie. You tie and do whatever technique you do before you soak it into water. So if you are ready to dye, your dye stuff, everything is ready, you just soak it into water and then transfer it, okay? So you apply the dye, that is, you soak it into the dye stuff itself. Then you let it sit. You have to wait for a while because your dye has to penetrate through the fabric properly. And the longer you wait, the deeper color you will get. Do you understand? You are dyeing green. The longer you wait, the deeper green you will get. Do you understand? So after that, this is the post uh, uh, dyeing process. You rinse. You rinse first with plain water before you wash. Washing is with the detergent and wear your garment. Over here, this garment, garment here, it means the person is dyeing a garment. Okay? If our ours is going to be a fabric and garment, so it goes through the same process. So there's a video here uh, we will be watching very soon. So let's come to the real deal. I have already explained every step already. The What we saw was just titles. So pre-washing before dyeing fabric, which is scoring, which is what I have said, our fabric has already gone through uh, scoring. The mesmerized cotton, it has gone through that process already. So we would be doing this pre-washing itself. We normally just soak it. But if you check, you realize that why, why are they saying you should wash the fabric? Why are they saying you should pre wash the fabric? Maybe some to clear it for me, but the oils, especially because once there are certain things like oil, your dye cannot penetrate through that area. It has become a natural resist point for the dye. That is why we pre wash. But our fabrics have already gone through those pre washing. Method. So we will not be doing pre-washing like that, okay? So this is done. So in this case, chemicals are also used, okay, to do this pre-washing, to clean the fabric properly. As you see, deep cleaning procedure. So, and it is used to make sure the fabric receives the dye with a good even penetration of dye color into the fibers. If they say even penetration, we do not, the fabric is sitting in the color at the same time. Why would the fabric come out as our parts are light green, some are, something is happening somewhere. So, uh, the pre-washing is done to remove all those oil or stains that may become a resist. When you don't plan that that area should be, should resist dye. So you prepare your fabric for dyeing. Mm -hmm. So you find tools, cooking pots, stainless steel, 
is considered to be a non-reactive pot. You also need something to stir the pot and fabric with. If you don't have anything to stir, the, the only thing we have been doing is uh, uh, turning the fabric whilst wearing gloves. You'll be turning the fabric whilst so that it can absorb even. Okay. Then we have additives. Post sodium carbonate or washing soda into a pot. Put okay. uh, washing soda is caustic, so protect your hands and clothing. I have mentioned caustic soda already. If you joke with it, it will burn your hands and create a sore on your uh, hand or finger. Okay, so you add water. You pour water into your pot on top of the soap and additive. Make sure your fabric is enough. Um, your fabric has enough room to move around in the water. A recommended, a recommended ratio of water to fabric is two to one. It, like, they're talking about how much water you pour on your uh, that your mixture. Okay. Then you add the fabric. So with that one, we'll be doing it when we get to the practical side. Before you prepare a dye stuff, you have your containers. You see the dye. We are supposed to mix it with warm or through hot water. Is is to prevent lumps. Okay, in the dye. It's just like you trying to mix corn flour with water. You see how it behaves. If you use cold, okay, even if you are in the kitchen, it's a hand we use, but if you just pour the water, cold water over it, you will get it. So unless you use warm water instead to dissolve all those things. Another thing that behaves in that way is serilac. When you pour, that's why you say we should ask for serilac. You pour the hot water for the food to even swell a bit, that one, and then to prevent uh, lumps in it. So, in the, well, for this purpose, it is to prevent lumps in our dye. If we have lumps in the dye, and you dye of our, what do you think will happen? It will just come and paste itself on one part and create a round, brown pattern there for you when you are not looking for that. Okay? So, you will mix your solution or your dye stuff in a small container with the caustic soda and everything, when you realize that it is well saturated or dissolved, then you now pour it into a bigger bucket or a bowl and then pour your water over it before and stay, before you come and add your soaked uh, fabric to it. Okay. Right. Now, like I mentioned, the waiting time depends on you. How much you want the fabric to absorb. However, you need to give it time also. If you don't give it some time to absorb the dye, remember, if you wash, some color to will wash off. And if you make it so light, if you don't take that at the end of the day, you have something looking like it's fading when it is not. <laughs> okay. So that is just for step one. The point under step one. Step two, which is the preparing of the fabric uh, uh, dye. So this over here, how to dye the fabric is what is under preparing the fabric dye. It, it is even what I mentioned earlier on. You want to prepare the dye. You need the hot water and whatever. So step two is about preparing your dye. Okay. And that's what I just spoke about. Now, look at this. People add salt to increase the color fastness there's no harm in using the salt you can choose to use it it will help in color fastness even uh, now i don't know if we still do it at first our mothers when they want to wash their printed fabrics they will add salt to the water they don't care if the soap will ladder or not once the salt and the soap ladder small, they are okay because the fabric will not fade. Uh -huh. so over here, you add the color to the dye before you dye your fabric. So it's believed that it will add color fastness. Your color will not run out 
of your fabric easily. So that is one point and the, the fab, preparing the fabric dye. Then storage. Now your dye is prepared and ready to receive the material. So at this point, too, at this stage, this is when you immerse your fabric into the dye. Okay. Then add the dye uh, fabric. I've already mentioned it's from that step. The next step is to add the fabric you want to dye to the solution you have already made. Okay. Now you see wet the fabric. That is prepared to continue with the fabric that's already wet from scoring or cleaning. I told you before you dye, you need to wet your fabric. So the best thing is that I ask for soaking the fabric in water. There's no harm. You can soak it. But when you are working, the best thing is once you know you are ready, the mixing of the dye is not any time. We just one click. You just pour hot water on the dye and mix it to, to finish right now. So once you know you are ready for the dye, once you enter your workshop and you know that you won't do anything, all you are coming to do is to dye. You have already tied your fabric and everything. Once you enter, just soak all your uh, uh, pattern or whatever fabrics into water, then collect your tools. So by, by, by that time, the fabric would have softened up. You understand? With the water. Then after dyeing, you remove your fabric. When you remove your fabric, you wash it. We have said that already. You rinse it, you wash it with detergent, and then you dry. After drying, you need to iron as well. Then drying dyed fabric. I've already said that already. You dry it. Yeah, so that is for those are the points for um, dyeing of the fabric itself. Any question? Okay. So let's look at the batik, the last one. For today. Now, what is ba a batik? How do we do batik process? It also consists of using a, a resist material, which is wax. This time around, you are not going to tie. It's not tie dye, but we will dye. Yes, we exactly. We will dye, but not tie. So, in this case, batik is a textile dyeing method. That is popularly used to create fabrics or clothing and household decor. While somewhat similar to in appearance to tie dye, the process for how to batik is a bit more complex with hot wax applied to the fabric prior to dye application and removed via, via boiling after the dye is complete. If I show you two fabrics, one is batik, one is tie dye, can you differentiate? <laughs> you see yes. the batik? Batik, yes. Batik. You can differentiate. Okay. No problem. <laughs> but one thing in batik that is dyed, some people also prefer going in for blocks and create patterns on the blocks or designs or motifs on the blocks. So when you lay your fabric, you would uh, melt your wax. Wax is just like candle, the way candle is, that is wax, but with, it, with their implies, it's big. So you break the uh, an amount of it and then you melt it in a pot, an aluminum pot or something like that. And then you lay your fabric. You might have marked out the areas you want to apply your motif to. So you dip your block into the wax. The wax needs to be hot. However, you have to be careful that the wax is not burning before you use it. So the temperature of the wax is also essential in this method. It has to be very hot so that once you take it and apply it, the fab it can the fabric can soak it, but the batik, the wax shouldn't be burning. 
How do you know that the wax is burning? If you are, you have oil, you want to fry meat, and you pour your oil in a pan, waiting for it to be hot. How do you know that your oil is hot? And how do you know that? Or let me use this one. How do you know that your oil has bypassed hot and it is burning? What do you see? You don't see the color first. Exactly. You'll be seeing smoke. Small, small smoke coming. It means that your oil is burning. That is how wax behaves. If your wax all of a sudden starts producing small, small smoke, know that the wax has bypassed that temperature you are looking for. It is burning. When it happens like that and you are using something like stove, just off the stove and be using the wax because when you off the stove too, it will become cooler and it will be hardening. And if you it gets to a point and you still don't on the stove again to get it to that temperature, if you use the cold one too, the fabric too cannot uh, penetrate fully. So if you die, the fabric will penetrate some parts. You understand? Yes. So you use your pattern print on the areas that you want to apply your motives. In this case, we are still thinking that our fabric is in white, okay? So you do all that. It means that uh, at this stage, when we mix our dye stuff, the dye stuff mixing process remains the same. So we will go and dye. So let's assume our first color is yellow. And then we have dyed yellow. That is all we want to dye. After we have dyed, we will now boil water, boiling water. When you dye, you remove it. You leave it for a while mm -hmm. for the dye to relax and disperse properly. And then you go in for boiling water. So yeah, your yeah. water yeah. will be on fire in a pot. It will be boiling. And then you dip your fabric into it. And that is why you have to be careful because that water is boiling. The water will dissolve the wax. So once you dip it inside one, two, you see that oh the wax will just release itself. And when you dip it inside, what sometimes what people do, because of hot it's hot water, so you have to know how to maneuver around it. So some people will dip half of the fabric inside. When it is done, they will try and remove it and turn the fabric and put the other side in it. Whilst some people will fold the fabric and put the whole fabric in the water, stir it with a stick. When it is done, they remove it with the stick. When it cools a bit, then they will remove it themselves and wash it. And then, and how do you say this way? When you wash it, you have to shake it so that the small, small wax pieces that are lying on the surface of the fabric will come off. Do you understand? And so you will get a white and a yellow background in that instance. What about if you are dying two colors? It's the same thing. So this time around, we still have our yellow, and then maybe we want to dye with a, a, a green. Let's assume a deep green. All right. So in this case, after we have dyed the yellow, we will not de-wax our fabric. We will leave it for it to dry a bit. Then we will lay the fabric again, and then the yellow parts that we want our motif to take. We will do the waxing again on the yellow parts. And when we are done this time, then we now dye in green. So all the yellow parts that are exposed, we take the green. So when we are done, we will, we will de wax the, the fabric in hot boiling water. And then we will get three colors, which is the background white, yellow, and green. That is how batik is done. Any questions? So, everything I have said is in this point. Carve the design onto a sponge block using a knife. The sponge block over here is foam. That cube foam, we, I told you, people sell um, by the roadside or even in stores. Those the cube ones, yes. That is mainly, basically, <laughs> that's what we use. Eh? The commonest this thing around us material. That is what we use. Yeah. 
Look at Batek gloves. What is so difficult about making out what Batek is and making out what Taina is? So if it were an assessment, like an exam, and I bring five batiks, five tie-dye, and I ask you to tell me which ones are batik, which ones are tie-dye, will you tell me that you will be fumbling or what? Look at this interesting design that somebody has done with batik. Very nice. And all this is just on the block. The only complex thing here is the colors are many. So the person had to sit down and know which parts of the block comes first and which one comes second. But at the end of the day, the person has gotten it. And if this fabric sells more and more, or is more expensive than this, why should you be angry? You understand? Because this one involves a lot of work and a lot of work than this or this. Do you get it? Which one? This one. Yes, it also has many colors. It has many colors, but the process is more simpler than this first one. Do you understand? This one, the violet was the last color to be dyed. All right, that was the last color to be dyed. But the yellow and the, and I'm saying yellow, the green and the blue were um, dyed after, you see this white? You see this white? That was the, back, the background of the fabric. So the, the motif or the block was stamped with wax first. Then when they died, they died in blue and green. So they died one color, maybe the blue. And then when they finished, they found that maybe there was another block because this is a design. Then you stamp on the same position again. But at this time, because it is designed, the stamp has this area. It's not the first one, the second stamp has this area, so it will also now go and bring the wax on those empty spaces and it will maintain the blue. Then we'll come and do for green too. Okay? And then afterwards, you dye the general color. So when you do wax, all the wax here will melt off and expose those ones. So over here, the only complication is that the person went through a lot of dyeing processes, about four dyeing. Over here, it's a different case. <laughs> Do you understand? The, the first one is more, more complex than this one. Okay. Any other? Should we continue? Should yes. we go down? So, the various dyes of fabric and their color fastness properties, we'll do it in our next uh, lesson. Not uh, today. So we'll do that in our next lesson. Any questions on today's uh, no lecture? Alright, then uh, we'll meet in our next lesson. So stay tuned.